um, uh, I'm, I'm not so Churchill. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm Philip Murphy. I'm um, acting director of the Institute of Historical Research, and I was just sort of passing, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but they're occupying Sarah. So um, it looks as though I'm going to be chairing, um, unfortunately. So uh, for, for you, but not for me, because I, I will really enjoy this. Um, so we've, we've got a session on public history. Um, we have, as our three distinguished speakers, uh, Justin Bengry, who's a lecturer in history um, at Goldsmiths uh, University of London. Um, Catherine Fletcher, who's associate professor uh, in the history department at Swansea University. And David Langrish, who's head of public policy at the National Archives. Um, and we're going to just have a kind of 10 minute, 50 minute presentation uh, from each of them, and then we'll we'll open up for for questions. So, thank you all for thank you all for coming. Um, hope you enjoy the session. So, we'll start with we'll start with Justin. So please. I'll stay seated so I can get the microphone in the right uh, position. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah fine. Perfect. So I'm coming to public history through, through queer history, and that's what I'm going to be speaking about today, and thinking about specifically a few examples of the kinds of work and projects that I've been involved in that illuminate how public history can be used to engage with, with queer history, which is a, an area of study where we have limited access to, to, to sources, or the types of sources that we have are, are limited to what Jan Pimblett at the London Metropolitan Archives refers to as the mad, the bad, and the sad. So, of course, this really restricts the kinds of histories that we can tell. Public history opens up to us the opportunity to engage with a wider range of publics and to collaborate on knowledge production with those publics um, for the more recent past especially, but not entirely exclusively. Um, it also opens up the possibility to a wider public of understanding what queer history is. Because it's so important, for me at least, that this is based within history. Because there's a public perception that the study of the queer past is through queer theory, which is associated with being incredibly uh, esoteric, inaccessible, hard to understand, not written for the wider audience. Um, and, and of course, some of that's true. It is written for, in many cases, a, a smaller community of scholars interacting with each other. Whereas queer histories are very often written precisely to speak to wider audiences and to engage with wider audiences. So speaking to it from a history perspective and a public, a public history perspective becomes particularly important. It also uh, offers us the opportunity to go beyond these limited stories I was describing a moment ago to, to get a fuller range of people's experiences and understandings of the past so we can get people speaking about and engaging with their own life stories. The problem with this can be sometimes, and this is something I've encountered in a number of projects that I've worked on, is working with people to understand what can constitute history because historians but also the public are kind of programmed to understand what history means, big all capitals uh, history. And, and there's a lot of work we have to do to break down what constitutes valid and valuable histories. And that's been especially true in, in queer history. So one of the projects that I've been involved in is, is one through Historic England called Pride of Place, England's LGBTQ heritage. And this was a project set up, I guess, a couple of years ago now. It's kind of roughly run its course, but it keeps ticking along happily. And uh, this was a project to look at the built environment and queer histories um, in, in England alone. It's English heritage, so we were, we were limited on the scope and scale of what we, could, what we could examine. But a big part of this was engaging with the public through a crowdsourced map, because there was, as I said, there's so much information, so much knowledge, so much experience that we couldn't access as historians, that we didn't have access to through traditional archival documents or other records. And, and, and materials, knowledge, information that actually doesn't exist in any kind of physical form that can be researched. It only exists in the memories of individuals that can describe places to it. In this case, it was places. But describe histories and experiences and knowledge um, to us. So I'll scroll down a little bit. Oops. 
So the crowdsourced map was the most public-facing element of, of the Pride of Place project. And in that, we ended up with about 2,000 places that were mapped um, across England. Um, one of the funnest things for me is coming to audiences like this and asking you, after London, what do you think was the queerest place in the country? People say Brighton. Brighton is no. I go to Brighton and I say to them, "You're doing a really, you're bad queers. You're not putting things on." <laughs> <laughs> Manchester Bridge. Manchester. Man Hampton Bridge comes up. Manchester. Manchester too. I think there was an assumption. Oh, someone else has done it. Manchester is there, and there's a good amount in Manchester. Bristol. No, not Bristol either. Though they do amazing work with mapping and public history, so that is a very good guess. Harrogate. Uh, no, although the baths there should be uh, the the royal baths should be uh, uh, listed. Uh, or they are listed, but they should list it on our map as well. Nottingham. <laughs> Nottingham is the queerest place outside of London. Uh, but that's an issue in public history, though, because what we had was a, public, a few members of the public that were especially engaged with the map, that had the time, the resources, and the energy to map every instance of a queer, uh, an LGBTQ event, place, site, whatnot, onto the map, even if it was happening in the same place at different times across, across the years we were looking. Um, and that created Nottingham as this icon of, of LGBTQ heritage in England. So we were talking before about the, uh, in the past panel, about digital history. This is something now with the, uh, with the Pride of Place map. If someone comes to this in 200 years, they'll be like, who knew Nottingham missed this amazing location of LGBTQ history, almost on par with London? Who knew this? It will write histories in mm, a lopsided way, perhaps. But there is something interesting and important about the, um, something historical about the, 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 the energy resources and the time that people had and the community investment in Nottingham that is significant that could be read from the map. So further on with the map, we had the issue here especially of uh, working with people to understand that their lives and their histories were valid queer histories because we wanted to define the map, define the project as identifying any location of LGBTQ heritage in England. And that was to be defined by users. That wasn't necessarily where um, a great political event had happened or an execution had happened. It could be anything from someone saying, this is where I met my partner. This is where I fell out with my partner. This is where I feared something happening. This is where I uh, engaged with, for the first time with my homosexuality or someone else's or had a discussion. It was absolutely fascinating once we had people engaging with the map in that way to see how, how queer history could be expanded and exploded more widely to, be, to see what could be included. And in terms of knowledge co-production, it was astonishing what came to us. We were the so-called experts but incredible knowledge and information was coming to us that had real consequences. The best example is a house called St. Anne's Court in Chertsey, which i would never heard of before. An amazing modernist house that a, uh, a sort of, uh, I believe it was an um, architectural historian that uh, uh, I think, uh, not academic, but in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the field of architecture, in practical architecture, had submitted information about this, this house and how two men had lived there and the design of the house had been such that they could separate the bedroom when guests came over for plausible deniability that they weren't a queer couple. But they could go back together again when the coast was clear. Uh, this was astonishing. We were able to double check that. We were able to write that into the listing information of this house. It was already a grade two or grade two star listed modernist house for its architectural significance. So that fed into what now appears on the official listing designation with Historic England. It then went full circle because Al Professor Alison Oram and I um, were then asked to speak, uh, to be on a short video for the BBC discussing this, this amazing house. So it goes uh, in these circles of, of exchange and knowledge um, that are really only accessible through, through taking a public history perspective on, on this kind of work. Another project I've been involved in is Queer Beyond London, and this is looking at LGBTQ, heritage, or LGBTQ histories in four cities outside of London. Brighton, Leeds, Plymouth, and Manchester. Shame we didn't have Nottingham. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's more of a traditional academic project with, uh, with monographs, articles, and whatnot. It's uh, uh, traditional in that sense, AHRC funded, 
But a big, uh, a big part of it has been witness testimony seminars and public fora. So we've gone to each of the four cities and had not just oral history interviews, but had groups of people coming together to engage with us and with each other in a recorded seminar, speaking about the queer histories of these four cities. Um, and that's been able to, to well, do some of this knowledge exchange again. We learn about queer histories through the individuals that come to these events, and they learn from each other, working with each other and talking with each other, like each other and sometimes coming into conflict with each other. There's been interesting engagements of all sorts um, at these public witness testimony events. Um, but it opens up all kinds of ways of thinking about queer history differently when you're engaging not just individuals crowdsourcing a map, as in the private place exhibit, um, and, uh, and crowdsourced project, um, but engaging with each other and actually being in conversation as, as a means to uh, build the project as well. Um, at Goldsmiths, uh, where we've launched the world's first MA in queer history, we're also uh, including a public history module in which students will be working with external partners to the college to build a queer history project. So that's something uh, with the range and breadth of people that are here today, I'd be very keen to discuss uh, with anyone as well. But I'll leave that one there. Just to finish, because I think I'm running, running out of my time, um, I want to think a little bit about the pros and cons of public history. And, and of course the pros I think I've spoken to already, just this incredible opportunity to engage with a wider range of voices and to expand what we think history can be. It's also amazing for me as a researcher to find incredible support and enthusiasm outside of my colleagues and peers, but in a wider public that either hasn't been exposed to some of these histories, hasn't thought about them in the ways that we're working on them, or hasn't had the opportunity to impact historical research and practice on questions that directly impact their lives. Um, there's incredible amounts that we can learn for each other using public history to engage with queer histories. But I'm also very conscious that people like me tend to come to, people, to events like this and, and speak through uh, rose-colored glasses of how amazing public history is and all these wonderful, fantastic things it can do. But there are really serious challenges to engaging with a wider public as an historian of a marginalized community. And I think also especially for women that are engaging publicly um, in, in histories um, as well, because as soon as you're engaging with a wider public and putting yourself out there in a public context, you're very often liable to, to trolling, to uh, uh, verbal attacks, to online attacks. And certainly that's been an issue that we need to discuss with our students and colleagues much more openly and prepare them for the possibility of being attacked online, of having really terrible, threatening things said to them because they hold opinions and do work on controversial subjects or on marginalized communities. It's also the fact that these, these communities, many of which we're part of ourselves, are not homogenous. They're not going to agree with everything we say or the, the approach that we take to understanding them. And these communities can be split themselves. So while it can be incredibly validating and supportive to work with marginalized communities that one is part of, it can also be the most devastating critique when, when your own community is, 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 is negative about the work you do or attacks the work that you do because it's not always constructive and critical. And I think that's something else we need to engage with in environments like this and with our students, preparing them for the fullest range of responses they're going to get when they, when they engage with wider publics. Thank you. to build on that a little bit by talking about some of the relationships between academic history and public history. Um, if you go back to 2004, um, when I was first um, embarking on a PhD, which was looking at Henry VIII's ambassador to Rome, I mentioned in passing to my supervisor that um, maybe there might be a book for a wider audience. 
um, on this topic. Henry VIII and his divorce from Catherine of Aragon, which was my big case study, was a topic with some public <coughs> resonance. And I was told that, you know, if I was looking at an academic career, that probably wasn't a good place to go. By 2010, when I'd finished my doctorate, and I was a year and a half out of it, suddenly this was a great idea. Things changed very, very rapidly through that first decade of the millennium in terms of how academic and public history were relating. So I wrote that book. I wrote that book, and the minute I had that book, and I was on the academic job market with that book, and it's, it's the same book in two different editions, and I started getting job interviews, and I started getting job offers, and in 2012, I became a lecturer in public history at the University of Sheffield. Now, at this point, um, shortly after I'd taken up that post, a rather posh chap from um, Oxbridge, who shall remain nameless, said to me, but Catherine, dearest, what is this public history? And I said, because I had prepared this witty reply that advice, my dear, it is the bastard child of impact and employability. <laughs> <laughs> and by this, I mean that um, the development of public history in academia is something that has not happened independently from other trends in the sector. And I'm very much a proponent of the types of things that public history can do, but I think we also need to understand that <coughs> It, that the way it has happened in universities is not without um, some problems. So, for example, when I refer to impact, I refer to the, the agenda within the assessment of academic research that the government does every few years, and the desire to measure the impact of that research, the impact which might be economic or cultural or social, but the idea, the pressure to say what you do must have an effect outside the academy. And so some of the, the emphasis on public history is about <coughs> pushing into that agenda and saying we've got to deliver things that have an impact outside. Now, you know, I, don't, I don't really have a problem with that, but it does leave some colleagues who are doing more theoretical blue skies research that doesn't have an obvious translation into a public format, or that is the kind of preparatory work, really detailed philological work on manuscripts that might enable somebody else further down the line to do the public work to worry that they're perhaps that, that that kind of research might be devalued. So, so it's not without its tensions on the impact front. It also plays into a development on the teaching side of universities, which is the pressure to do more to demonstrate that we're helping students acquire employability skills. When I was an undergraduate 20 years ago, um, Employability was something that you really got by being in student societies or the students' union or by, by, by being, you know, deputy captain of the sports team, that sort of thing. It wasn't particularly what you did in class. But more and more now, universities are being asked to show that we are equipping students with transferable skills for the job market. And some aspects of public history are within teaching are about showing, okay, we're going to help you get those skills. Now, ironically, out of these two trends that, um, you know, are in some ways problematic in and of themselves, we've got some marvellous results. We've got some very, very positive things happening in academia, and I think we have got um, types of research and types of engagement that weren't previously being valued, being valued, or in fact being valued again. Um, so this is my most recent book, The Black Prince of Florence, which is with a trade history imprint with Penguin Random House, the Bodley Head imprint. Um, and the other books that you see there are books that were written by academics in the 1960s and 1970s on similar topics for similar major imprints. So there's been a very long tradition of academic historians actually writing for wider audiences, which for a while seemed to have been pushed away a bit, the, and, and people like me back at the beginning of the PhD were being told it's kind of not really where you want to go. And so I think one of the things about um, the development of public history um, in this model of really um, an individual author writing for the public is that actually we've gone back to being able to do some things that people used to do. Um, and I think that leads me into a question about 
what exactly we mean by public history, because this term is a term that's used rather loosely in a quite a wide variety of ways. Um, the type of co-production work that Justin was talking about, history done by the public or with the public, is one type of public history. There's also a type of history which is the more sort of commercial type of public history, you might examine, which is history that's sort of done for the public, um, where you might look at um, books like these, you might look at TV programmes or radio programmes, things where members of the public may not be very involved in the production of them, but they're aimed at wider audiences. Now, there's a little bit of a false dichotomy here because one of the things about social media um, is that you can get a lot of engagement with members of your audience, even if the original product is you know, a radio programme that, that you made or a book that you wrote. There are, there are ways of talking and there are ways of engaging people and building more history out of that initial intervention. But I think it's important to say that public history is defined in these various ways. In the US, it tends to be um, used in a way that's more analogous here to the way we might talk about heritage sector professionals. Public history being people who are employed in professional um, public historian roles in museums or in archives, for example. And sometimes public history is used simply to mean um, history that's not academic history. It's defined quite negatively. It's everything else that is somehow outside the academy. And, but I think in some sense, what we're talking about is work that engages on some level with um, non-expert audiences. Um, but it is rather ironic that we talk about public history um, when in fact this also incorporates some of the most privatised and commercial history in sense that, of, of history that is done for money. And I think that, that market element to public history, which is one of the aspects of it that I am personally involved in, is on the one hand quite li limiting sometimes, and on the other hand can be very liberating. It's limiting in the sense that you need to work with what other people, publishers, TV commissioners tell you that the market will bear. And sometimes in my case, for example, that book, The Black Prince of Florence, could be commissioned because the Black Prince in question is a member of the Medici family. If it had been some other random illegitimate black person living in Renaissance Italy, that book would probably not, as a piece of non-fiction, have got the hearing it did. It's the fact that it could be tied to a very well-known historical brand name that meant a publisher you know, felt they had enough confidence to, um, to invest in it. So there are limits in that sense. There's that, that limit where we just get Tudor history after Tudor history after Tudor history because there is, is a perception that the Tudors sell. And so publishers will keep paying for those books. And in other areas of history, you will see that they are, they are more reticent. Um, on the other hand, I would say that, that for me, doing more public history and teaching and research has been very liberating. So I have got to try um, some radio and TV broadcasting, and I've worked with people who are expert producers um, in those areas, and that has been very stimulating in making me think about how I write and how I communicate. I have got to try doing theatre. Um, that is me dressed up there in the red dress on bottom with the, with the sparkly uh, headdress, um, doing, uh, working with some theatre students to do an immersive performance where all our audience came and had a party in 1530s Florence. And that was very stimulating for my own academic research because of what it meant was that I had to answer lots of questions from the performers, from the people who came to the imagined party as we were going along about how things would happen. And some of those questions were questions that I would not have thought of had they not been raised by the people around me trying to do this recreation. So I think it can be very stimulating indeed. I would just, to, to finish then, I suppose I just want to pose the question for discussion about where public history might go next. I think, you know, the trends about impact and employability that I mentioned in relation to academia, I don't think are going away. 
the, the impact is going to be given a higher weighting in the next round of research assessment. So I think there will be continuing institutional support to do this type of work. On the other hand, I think that given the likely negative impact of Brexit on research funding and the availability of taxpayers' money more generally, there might actually be pressure to turn towards more commercial sources of income and there may actually be a funding squeeze on the amount of public money that's available for academic research projects and for all types of history projects that might reach out and include people more generally. So I think we can't get away from thinking about the broader economic climate in terms of trends that happen um, inside and, and outside of academic history and indeed the broader sector. I think one of the things that we might discuss, we might reflect on um, in terms of all these topics is the very significant inequality of resources that there is within public history if you compare the resources that small community history projects have to the resources that large university funded projects have um, and to explore something of you know how does that change the way and the types of history that are done how does history happen the more it is subject to market forces so i will leave it there and thank you very much Can you hear me at the back okay? No. Okay. Uh, my name is David Langrish, I'm the head of the public history team at the National Archives. Uh, we're all honoured to be here today, I hope you're enjoying the session so far and have a good rest of the day. Uh, for a little bit of a um, selling point, please do pop by the National Archives library stand, I'm sure they'll be delighted to see you. Um, what I'm going to do over the next 10 minutes or so is just give an overview of what the public history team does at the National Archives. So we are the archive for central government departments. We receive our records directly from those government departments, generally after 20 or 30 years after they were created. What I'm going to do as uh, we go through is just describe what we do, who we are, some of the examples of the work and projects that we've got involved with, especially the sort of public engagement outputs that we generate, uh, the multiple sort of types as well that we get involved in. Some of the challenges we face, which um, Justin and Catherine have touched upon already, and then just looking at some of the future work that we have as a team coming up um, that might be of interest. So what is public history and who are we? Uh, we are made up of a team of eight people. Um, we are record specialists in a variety of different topics and subjects. Um, covering genealogy, citizenship, military history, uh, local history, social history and diverse histories. Um, we utilise both conventional and uh, innovative methods to improve access to our collections, so through digitisation and cataloguing projects to make specific collections more easy to search and find, um, to more innovative methods to showcase the rich stories and experiences that can be found within our collections, uh, some of which are very sensitive uh, topics as well. As a team, we get involved in a variety of different projects. Um, various public history books and publications will refer to these in different ways, but we get involved in grassroots projects which would be driven and designed by local history groups or local uh, societies. Uh, volunteer groups. Uh, for example, we've done some work with the Age UK Centre in Twickenham. We drive our own projects and get involved in other institutional-led projects, so we will partner with institutions like the London Metropolitan Archives um, to do collaborative projects. 
and when we will get involved in research projects so we work with university partners um, usually to offer more sort of public impact engagement opportunities as part of their project so we work at the moment for example with St Mary's University to help with the running of their public history MA course we offer uh, free workshops as part of that course each year and a placement um, system or placement scheme for the students uh, after Christmas and we're into the third year of that um, arrangement. Our motto for our team uh, when we're looking at public history is that it should be open and accessible to all regardless of your background it might be that you have a long-term career in public history or the teaching of history it might be that you just have a passing interest so you may pass a war memorial on your way to work each morning. You may just have an interest in a particular current affairs topic on the news and you want to learn a bit more about it. So it may be a very short uh, interest, but we try to make ourselves as open as we can um, to help open our records as well and try and change the impression of an archive, which for some people can be quite an intimidating place to go to, especially when uh, government files have stamped on them, closed and restricted access, all that sort of thing from many decades ago. In doing so, we try to foster very close uh, internal and external working relationships which bring our collections to life. In, as I say, as a, um, we will look at some examples shortly, but sometimes it's not by actually using the original document first hand, it is taking some of the stories and experiences that are detailed within them and recreating that in an immersive or a dramatic uh, way. And what that obviously leads to um, is then relationships that we can work on long term, not just on one project, but we can come to uh, many times over to do similar projects and build those relationships up uh, with some of our external partners. Some of the methods that we use to engage with the public um, as a team are through our conventional advisory services. So researchers of any background can come to the National Archives in person and um, speak to colleagues like myself on the inquiry desks. There's no appointment necessary. Please don't come on a Monday because we're closed. Um, or we can answer inquiries over the telephone, email, live chat and by letter. So that's really our first point of call. Um, and we have picked up many different projects and collaborations and partnerships via that way of people coming to the desk talking about what they're researching and that develops a contact between the specialist and the researcher in front of them. So more con conventional ways of improving access to our collections are through cataloguing dig digitisation projects um, which look to make the collections easier to search and more accessible so removing indexes um, adding, making it easy to search by things like name or place um, and that just helps people actually get hold of that material quicker um, and obviously take the data they need from it. All of the team uh, contribute to our public events programme which is called What's On. We offer a variety of different event formats from your conventional talks to uh, workshops, document workshops and also performances. Increasingly, we're moving into delivering exhibitions, um, and we've got a, a bigger exhibitions program developing for 2018, and that will help drive uh, and stimulate more of our uh, what's on programming. We get involved in externally funded projects, so for example, at the moment, we've got some funding from the Wellcome Trust to catalogue uh, some First World War medical case sheets, which will obviously linking to the legacy of the First World War as it comes to an end and the impact it had longer term for people, soldiers and nurses. We can get involved in academic collaborations, as I say, with St Mary's as an example, uh, and give papers at conferences. And we write blogs and articles uh, for our website and also for magazines. I'm going to give a, just a few examples now of some of the work we've done in the past. These are just a few. Uh, there are obviously many more to give. We've done a digitisation project a few years ago to um, make available online the papers of a Middlesex Military Service Tribunal from the First World War. So these are people seeking um, 
seeking exemption from conscription which was brought in in 1916. Now many people would just think of this as a military collection, in fact the stories within them are very um, sensitive and reveal a lot about social history, so another important aspect for public history. So for example on the screen now on the left the newspaper cutting is of a father of four who committed suicide because his four sons were called up to serve uh, via conscription. Uh, the middle, um, sort of more pink coloured entry is an applicant outlining that his wife had died of TNT poisoning, um, doing munitions work, and so as a single parent, um, and also dependent for his uh, elderly parents, he needs to sort of stay home. And then the final uh, image there on the right is an uh, anonymous letter from a local resident um, writing to the tribunal not in support of a local applicant, but actually describing him as a rock, rotten shirker. Um, so it reveals the sort of social tensions that can be created. Uh, and it's an important reminder when we look at public history. But it's also about how community uh, experience certain situations, certain circumstances. So these papers reveal to us what it was like to live in the war, what it was like to live under conscription, but also what it was like to live under day-to-day -day normal challenges that would have faced so many uh, families and households across the country uh, during this period. Other examples to be drawn from this collection are the wife and applicant writing to the tribunal, um, actually pleading for her husband to be taken into the army. <laughs> um, uh, because of the, um, the poor life that he led her and her children. So that, that obviously does start taking us into some very sort of sensitive and delicate um, domestic situations. So it's also trying to take, once we've digitised this material and we've identified these experiences, very personal experiences, is then handling them very sensitively, but also showing people that there is material here that may still be relevant to today's society and what can we learn from the past and how can it help us shape the future. It's not just through cataloguing and digitisation, uh, we also look for more dramatic and immersive ways of showcasing what we have in archives to highlight that archives are not just boring places to go to but can be very fun and entertaining. Uh, the image, the black and white image you see in the top left is an image from one of our legal files and that is of the Caravan Club, which was a um, queer space in London, in Soho, in the 1930s, where men could go to socialise, meet other men, start relationships. Uh, the files that we have are obviously from a government perspective, where they're sort of closing these places down, raiding these places, closing them down, arresting people, and the sort of court records that follow. We started a, a project with London Metropolitan Archives via the Be Being Human Festival, uh, which gave us some funding uh, to run a couple of events around um, um, queers, um, queer in the state, it was called, so around queer history, using some of these files. The National Trust came along to one of those events, and subsequently we went into partnership with them to recreate the Caravan Club in Soho, and the image, the colour image in the bottom right is what they came up with. And that was very close to the original location as well. And so they were leading tours around Soho and also um, having events at the Caravan Club. So entertainment, um, singing, dancing, um, refreshments. And so it's an example of how we can use archive collections to recreate the past, to bring it back to life, uh, in more dramatic ways, in more immersive ways, rather than it just being you need to come to an archive and read through a, an old paper, dusty record. As a team, though, we're also very keen to get involved in extending interest in and learning from public history and wider history. On the left there, you see a news story from our website where we've started doing a um, summer school with King's College London. Uh, first time we've done that over the summer, just gone. So it's a two day workshop, one day at National Archives, one day at King's, uh, looking at family history, genealogy, 
um, research and how to sort of build up your experience and take the next steps, start learning how to use online sources, how to uh, use original documents and, and build up your confidence. And on the right hand side, as I mentioned before, we have been working with St. Mary's University to support their public history MA course. And the students, as part of their placement scheme with us, they come and visit us once a week for 10 weeks, need to generate a blog for our public website. So they use some of the material collections that they are interested in, and then they get the chance to write a blog art article which will go on our website, explaining their research, what they've found. And obviously that gives them something to demonstrate when they then take the next step after that master's course in trying to secure uh, employment. So that's just some examples of how we try to um, work in a variety of different projects and partnerships. Some of the challenges we face, um, we as a government archive need to remain neutral. Um, we mainly work to the ethos of these are the records, these are open, this is how you use them, come and explore them. Um, we obviously have many sensitive topics um, as a government archive. In some cases, like the, the, the um, queer history projects we're involved in, our records are going to show some of the um, ways in which government dealt with those situations and circumstances, which obviously are going to upset people with the way in which it was referred to at the time and language used and the actual methods that were used at the time. We also have a challenge around reaching new audiences. Um, we want to reach out as much as we can to um, local groups, um, especially in diverse history areas. We want to reach out to those that wouldn't normally feel comfortable coming to an archive or would feel underrepresented in an archive. And then, of course, I'm sure we all share in this final one, there's the challenge of budgets and funding. Um, funding, as Catherine said, can become ever more um, competitive. And so it's about working up those partnerships uh, and, and developing them, strengthening them where we can. In terms of the future, um, over the next year, we're going to have some suffrage anniversaries that we're already working to. Um, we're going to have the end of the First World War and looking at its legacy. I think that's going to be a very important um, point for our team in, in, in the National Archives. We, we're seeing a lot of increased engagement, which is very positive with diverse histories, uh, and so we're, we're looking to explore that. Um, we have Vicky Iglikowski as our diverse histories record specialist. We now have Louise Bell as a First World War diverse histories researcher, and recently added Katie Fox from one of our other teams to help us looking at social suffrage history as well. So it's really growing. We want to put a lot more resources into that where we can. We're starting to get involved in adult learning programs. We want to develop that a little bit more. We've got 1921 census on the horizon. That's going to be a big project for us. And then the exhibition program, which I mentioned, which we, we want to develop a bit further. Um, thank you for your time. Um, that's just a very brief overview of public history at the National Archives. Happy to answer any questions with the panel, and obviously afterwards, if you have any, uh, if you'd like to just pop up and speak to me, that's absolutely fine. I'm really welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, three excellent presentations. I think I think our presenters win the award for the most seamless transfer of carbon <laughs> presentations <laughs> I've ever seen. I've ever seen in my life. That was that was quite incredible. Now. Some, some, some great news. There is, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one lost chair who is found than <laughs> <laughs> uh, 100 chairs who are there from the beginning. And Sarah Churchill is here. So, but I'm kind of I'm reluctant to relinquish the chair altogether because it's been, there's so many fascinating points. So what, I, what I'm going to do is, is ask Sarah to respond from the podium and then to bring her in to, to questions, and I, I'll sort of, um, because I, I've, I've got a question uh, which I, I'd very much like to, to ask. So, so please. Uh. Thank you, and apologies to everyone, especially um, to the panel and to Justin since I missed um, some of your talk. The first rule of public history is don't be 20 minutes late. <laughs> uh, so I really do apologize for that. Um, but I was, I was struck in listening to um, the papers I heard, um, 
how much we're all coming at this, I think, from very similar perspectives. So I'm not sure that I have very much that's different to add, but I might just um, amplify a couple of points that particularly um, resonated with me. First of all, I arrived more or less just as Justin was starting to talk about some of the challenges of, of, um, of public history for individual researchers. And um, I think it's worth underscoring those and thinking about that, not to start with the negatives, but I'll work up to the positives. Um, because as, as he rightly noted, there right now in our, in our current climate, there is a real vulnerability attached um, to particular individuals in particular um, in making yourself public. And, um, and that's particularly true, as he noted, for women. It can be true for queer people. It can be true for various minorities. Um, it's true for Jewish people. Um, I mean, as, as we know, we are in a very hostile political climate right now. Um, and I mean, you know, contentiously hostile, aggressive political climate. And that means that a lot of people who are putting themselves forward are vulnerable. And I agree that what we need to do, I feel very strongly, as a woman, that my personal response is that I won't be intimidated out of the public sphere and I won't be intimidated out of public speaking. But that's a personal response, and not everybody needs to uh, needs to react that way. For people who do want to go into those public spaces, I agree. We have, there's a very very strong um, uh, uh, burden on not burden that's not the right word, but obligation. We we have a, a, a very clear responsibility to help people. Um, <coughs> deal with those challenges and to make sure that they understand what challenges they will face and that they have the support that they need um, should that kind of uh, attack or onslaught um, come. Um, although, if I can say just as an aside, I won't go 10 minutes, don't worry, I'm just going to a couple of other points I want to make. Um, as an aside, I, I found something very, very unexpected happened. Um, I was on question time after, right after Donald Trump was uh, Elected. I hate even saying that. Um, I really do. And um, about two days later, and um, and I just two two points I want to make. Um, uh, the response to that was quite extraordinary. I was very outspoken in my uh, uh, contempt for Trump and in my horror at the outcome. And I was um, unsurprisingly uh, faced then with an online onslaught of misogyny. That was not surprising. What was surprising to me was that having studied misogyny for 20 years actually turned out to have inoculated me against it. It really did. And I didn't know that history could do that. I really didn't know it would do that for me. Um, but what it meant was that everything was so familiar that I didn't take it personally. It was just textbook. And I just went, well, this is just, this is just, and so I was actually playing misogyny bingo online with them and going, hey, this is old school. You called me a heritage. I didn't know people still use that word. <laughs> um, and, it, and it literally just rolled off of me. I was not, I was bothered by the fact of it, of course. I was bothered by its occurrence. But it, I was totally. Uh, 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 invulnerable to it. It was remarkable. So I recommend history, actually, because it's like a shield. It was like a suit of armor. It was fantastic. I just put on history and I felt great. Um, the other thing that happened was that I was uh, I was approached in the street the next day, first by a very tall, very angry white man who was very well spoken and well, except for what he said. And um, and he said, and I quote. Uh, you're that dreadful woman who talked a lot of shite last night on question time. And um, I did not have a, a previously prepared witty response, which mm -hmm. I'm sad to say. All I said was, how dare you, and kept walking. Um, and then a friend of mine pointed out that that was British for nasty woman, and I felt a lot better. <laughs> um, and then, literally about two hours later, a black man walked up to me and said, thank you for what you said last night. It was really quite extraordinary. And I would also add that no women walked up to me at all because women don't do that to women in the street. <laughs> the other point that I, that I just want to, um, to address is Catherine's point. I really, I loved your line about, 
uh, about public history, or I would extend it to public engagement, um, being the bastard child of impact and employability. Um, but I would also point out that in our current climate, we recognize that illegitimate children are just as good as their legitimate uh, siblings. And, um, and I think it's an important point because we, things, things can have dubious origins, um, and actually we can, we can do good with them. And um, in my own view of this kind of public um, engagement and the fact that it's supported by some um, impulses that may be inimical to what we're trying to achieve doesn't mean we can't still achieve what we're trying to achieve. And I view public engagement in those instances at least as a kind of Trojan horse. Um, they don't necessarily expect us to smuggle in what we are going to be able to smuggle in. And indeed, we might be able to, um, to use a, an unlovely current word um, to weaponize some of our learning. And I suppose that's what I, what I found about um, misogyny as well. So I think those were just the, the main points that I wanted to, um, to underscore. But um, I, I, really, I really enjoyed um, what you guys had to say. And as I say, as I, say I think it's very interesting how much uh, commonality there is um, for people doing this. Thank you very much. I'm um, American, I can project to the back, you'll be able to Yeah, <laughs> well, you, know, pass this, you, can, you can pick the mic up and okay. pass, pass them around. Okay. So, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions. I just have a, a kind of opening question to and it more of, a, more of a comment with a question mark at the end of it. I know that the more I, as I spell it out, it's going to sound like the most dreadful kind of liberal fantasy, but here goes. As a historian, I think, as professional historians, I think we see history as, above all, a, an art form. That's to say, it's about taking materials, about taking evidence, and spinning an argument which is convincing and in a way beautiful. Yeah. So one can appreciate uh, a work of history in a sense, no matter what the subject, what the argument is, where it's going, in terms of how it musters evidence, how it constructs an argument, how it creates something new. Um, and I think that's what, in a sense, what unites us as historians. When one passes into the public sphere, and this is really picking up on, on Sarah's point, one enters a profoundly political sphere in which people, there is an assumption that people, that history is morally improving. And therefore it's important that people, that children learn certain sorts of history and not other sorts of history. That public history dwells on particular subjects and not on other subjects. And there are certain subjects, I mean, I'm a historian of, of British imperialism. Um, there was a short-lived and rather unsuccessful museum of British imperialism at Bristol, which closed down after a few years. I think it is impossible to create a museum of British imperialism in this country now. It would, whichever, whatever you did with it, you would be torn apart. Your life would be a misery whichever way you went, because this is something that is so profoundly political. And in a sense, when you, this, this public engagement thing, you are in a sense riding the tiger of that politics, because you call publicity, you know that if a book is going to be, is going to be, you know, it's going to be talked about, there's, there's got to be a kind of controversial peg to hang it on. And, and therefore it becomes something else. And I just wonder what, what your response is, is to that, as, as a kind of a danger of public history. Okay, I, mean, I think, sorry, I'll stand up because I'll I'm hiding behind a computer screen. Um, I, I mean, I think one of just, uh, I really want to pick up on the first point you, you mentioned actually, which is about history as an art, because I think often when you step into the public sphere, there is a lot more expectation that history is quite a science. And that one of the questions I am most often asked by members of the public if I go out and do talks is, well, can you tell us the accurate version of this? And if there is one word I would really like to abolish from a discussion about history, it is that word, accurate. Because it's, it's a word that actually in professional academic history, we're very critical. We try to say you know, things like it's more likely that it worked like this. 
We say that some things can be uh, where there is a consensus about some basic facts, but there is very often, you know, history is a kind of continuing process of discussing different interpretations and trying to refine them and trying to improve them and about revising those interpretations as you go over time. So I think one of the difficulties about, you know, that this says history is always going to be political, you can't avoid that, and actually trying to win the argument with members of the public about say we need to think about history <coughs> rather more as an art form as and as a series of stories, yes, grounded in evidence, but as a series of, of ways that we talk about the past, as opposed to the correct scientific set of facts about what actually happened, I think is one of the most important things that public history can do. Um, from an archive point of view, it's for us it's slightly different, I feel, that for us, it's about access to the records. Uh, it's making sure that people know how they can access them, how they can view the records, where they're going to find the sort of information they're looking for for their research. And then it's down to the historian then to interpret those records in the way that they interpret them. Um, so it's slightly different from, from our perspective. I think. Continuing with the metaphor of the uh, uh, of artwork, certainly my experience working with with the public on queer history projects and with a queer public specifically is often an expectation that there is going to be a easily decipherable realist painting that describes how things were in the past. Getting to what Catherine was saying of the facts um, and, and and the fact that we come to it not only disputing the the the, the factual factual nature of these facts that we can inevitably find, so they think, in the in the past. There's also the issue of factual natures of identity and for, for marginalized communities and for queer history specifically, where a lot of the work that we're doing undermines that idea of a universal continuity of a lesbian or gay identity in the past that's easily discernible and recognizable to us in the present or even that when it is recognizable in the past, it must be very close or the same as what we experience today. And so I think uh, getting across this idea that the past is going to be not an easily discernible realist painting, but some kind of confusing cubist abstract expressionist uh, uh, expression of what people thought and didn't think and didn't understand that they thought they knew perhaps it's one context differently in another messes with people's heads today that are really politically and personally invested in a in a in a kind of identity that has real meaning today and it's necessary politically sometimes to have that continuity of identity in the past even if history unfortunately unfortunately disrupts that so what do you want to do? Uh, just very briefly i'll say um, to the to the point about uh, about this facticity of facts, um, and to the and to the, the the questions about what we can know and, and what we can access in the past. I'm just uh, reminded of a of a great um, thing that Hilary Mantel said when um, David Starkey was complaining that her novels um, weren't very good, uh, were fine for people who didn't know anything about the time, but for people who knew what happened, they weren't very interesting. And Hilary Mantel said, if, pro if, if, if Professor Starkey knows what happened in the past, I congratulate him. Um, which I thought, which I thought was sort of fabulous, and um, and I think that's absolutely right. I think it's really important that we that that part of what we do as um, as historians. But I would also say, I mean, I'm I'm trained as a uh, I'm a literature professor actually, although I do literary history, so I sit my work sits right in the cusp. Um, but it's true for the other um, humanities as well that that that, that these. Um, that these things are not as certain as, as people want them to be. But then, of course, what happens is the flip, people like them the flip side, because they love false dichotomies and easy binaries. So then we get the flip side, which is, oh, well, then whatever anybody thinks goes, and nothing can be known, and nothing can be true. And you will know, actually, some things are true, <laughs> and some things can be ascertained. But also there are multiple truths, and so and that's it's not it's not this simple binary. So um, how can we uh, enrich our understanding by seeing these multiple truths? Um, the other thing I would say that we need to that, that I think one of the things that public history can do in terms of our our uh, political climate is 
to strike a better balance um, uh, with the question of presentism, right? And by presentism, I mean the, um, the, 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 possible, the possible bias of wanting to skew our understanding of history in order to explain the present or to read the present through the past rather than respecting the fact that the past is uh, indeed a different country and that people did think differently, in, 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 particularly in the, in the distant past, um, about certain things that we take for granted, they just didn't have those epistemological constructs. And so there are, there are, there are various uh, uh, cautions that we need to, to keep reminding people of. At the same time, and that said, I also think that a, a judicious amount of presentism is a, is a very good thing sometimes. And to get people to see that indeed sometimes the past was not that different and that we can learn from, uh, that we can really learn from the past about our, our current political climate. I actually, I was supposed to spend the summer writing a book about Henry James and because of everything that's happening in America, I did not write a book about Henry James. I wrote a book about the history of America first and the American dream as phrases um, because neither of them is what we were told. And it is my hope that doing that kind of genealogical history can actually uh, expand our, under our, our current understanding of what we think those very loaded phrases mean. How much can one individual researcher do? Who knows? But each of us can try, or you know, right now with the indictments yesterday, there was a lot of talk about Watergate, and that was for good reason. The parallels are very strong, and, and we can learn from what happened in Watergate um, without trying to match them uh, equally, without trying to see them as somehow identical. Of course, they're not identical. Respect the differences, but learn from the similarities.